Um, other federal laws that were passed in that same time period have private rights of action, which means anybody can go into court and enforce them if they're being violated. The Marine Mammal Protection Act doesn't have that. It can only be enforced uh, by the federal government. Uh, at the same time, California has its own set of laws, and we have the ability to go into court and enforce certain laws in state court. If a local government is, is violating its own laws, we can get what's called a writ of mandate, lets us go into court and require the, the local government to do what it's supposed to do. So when the local government here was actually being forced uh, by a state court to chase the seals away at Children's Pool Beach and destroy their habitat, I went into federal court and said, look, we've got this Marine Mammal Protection Act, and I, create, I came up with some interesting uh, legal theories for standing and how we can even be in court since the Marine Mammal Protection Act doesn't have that private right of action. And in some of these cases, the city went along, actually agreed and said, yeah, we agree. Um, the plaintiff should have standing. We should get a temporary restraining order and not have to do this thing that we don't want to do anyway. And so you, kind of, you see this cooperation where you can, if you can find a hook, if you can find a way to get before, but that's the most challenging thing is to get the court to even hear your case. So that's what this legal personhood argument is all about. How do we even get into court um, on behalf of an animal? Now judges, can, um, judges don't write the laws, obviously. They're just there to make sure that the laws are being properly interpreted. And if there's a constitutional right that's being violated, then in that case, judges can overrule what the political um, side of what the political branches of government have enacted. So if you have a law that violates the Constitution, judges can overrule that law. But that's the only time that judges can actually change the way that a law is being interpreted or the way that a law is being applied. So we can't really have, you can't expect the judicial branch of government to be at the cutting edge of advancing animal rights. But it's all coming along in the, in the fields of science and with um, political activism on behalf of animals. We saw the watershed moment in 2008 when voters overwhelmingly passed Proposition 2, which is the Prevention of Farm Animal Cruelty Act, um, passed by over 65% of the vote. It showed that voters overwhelmingly want humane treatment of animals. Um, I remember when Ben Weso, who's now a state senator, was on the city council, and the city council was considering whether to support, pass a resolution supporting this ballot initiative. The uh, factory farmers came down and were talking about how you know, this would impact their business, blah, blah, blah. But ben Weso said, uh, you know, a, as a city council member, you know, I've heard all, all these arguments about how this is, these cages are okay physically for these animals, but I haven't heard anything about the, uh, the mental and, and emotional suffering of the animals. And this was, I mean, this was astounding because he's a city council member and he's talking about chickens. He's not talking about um, ch chimps and uh, elephants, like, like uh, unlocking the cage. But so just to hear that, Coming, you know, we're hearing more and more of the people recognizing people who have dogs and cats. Obviously, recognize that that animals have uh, um, emotional lives, and that they, it, you know, it's not just uh, your ability to do math equations or to or to have a, a conversation in in a, in a human language. We're seeing that animals have all kinds of cognitive abilities, and science is is opening the door to that. We're actually seeing the, the cognitive abilities of animals actually ex excel and, and rival that of humans in, in certain areas. Um, I had the opportunity to ask Judge uh, Vaughn Walker uh, when he came to San Diego and spoke a couple years ago. He, he's a retired U.S. district judge, and he happens to be the judge who decided the Prop 8 case, the case that where uh, the uh, state of California banned gay marriage, and uh, Judge Vaughn Walker overturned that, that ruling and said that that was unconstitutional. And he spoke a couple years ago at an American Constitutional Society event here in San Diego, and it's a pretty large audience. Um, and I was able to ask, and I stood up and, and, and asked him, and he happens to be a conservative as well. He was appointed by, Judge, or by uh, President H.W. Bush. So, and I asked him, do you see a day when using conservative legal principles, which are treating like things alike, that's, that's what conservative legal principles are, that if two things are the same, they ought to be treated alike. And we know that uh, complex uh, social animals like the orcas at SeaWorld and elephants in the zoo have the ability, uh, they, have, they have emotional intelligence and they have uh, intelligence that is, is being recognized by, by science as being similar, very similar to that of humans. And in fact, if you watch the movie Blackfish, you see that orcas have 
emotional intelligence that exceeds that of humans because they have a whole other, other part of their brain that they can actually and so feel things socially and, and interact in ways that we, we can't even imagine. Um, so I asked him, do you foresee a day that conservative legal principles could lead to uh, animals being given rights to appear before a court and be treated, be, be given the same uh, looking at the situation on the merits. So just like you saw in the movie where not, not looking at the species of the animal, um, but looking at uh, what cognitive abilities this animal has and should that confer legal personhood. And his, his answer was pretty, uh, pretty interesting and astounding. It was, I think that would be uh, something that would be really good to test with a trial because that's really where facts come out and that's where you get to the bottom of um, things like this is with, with a trial. And with the Prop 8 case, it was through a trial that he determined that he felt that Prop 8 was unconstitutional. He said in his speech that you know if the proponents of that ballot initiative that banned gay marriage had relied on simply the traditional definition of marriage and we're just gonna stick to the traditional definition of marriage because that's what it is, he might have bought that argument and said, okay, that makes sense. Marriage has been defined as between a man and a woman for thousands of years, um, and therefore that's, that's what it is. Um, but instead, they, they brought in all this evidence trying to prove that it causes all this harm to, uh, that, that gay marriage causes all this harm to um, straight marriage, and, that that, and therefore that's why it should be banned, and it just it didn't add up. They were bringing in all these facts that just didn't, didn't make sense, and, and it was through the, the results of that, that trial that, that he found that the, that the proponents of that ballot initiative had not met their burden and had not shown that, that it should be held to withstand constitutional scrutiny. And, um, and then the state of California determined also that it was uh, unconstitutional. They weren't going to defend it to the, to the Ninth Circuit, which is the, the appellate court. And, and therefore, the, the trial court ruling stood. And, that was when, and when the Supreme Court issued its, decided that it's not going to decide this because on the narrow issue of standing and that the, the, the uh, plaintiff uh, that the proponents of the ballot initiative didn't have standing to come before the Supreme Court of the state of California wasn't defended. The, the, the district court ruling stood in that, and that was the law of the land. So, so trials can be a really important way to bring these facts out. Um, and of course, in, in the movie, they were bringing petitions for rid of habeas corpus, which is, it's, you know, it's all just based on legal arguments and the papers, and that, that's often what we're left with in, in animal law, but if you can get your foot in the door and you can, and you can, and you can actually uh, have the facts come out before a finder effect, before a judge or jury, um, then you can get to the bottom of a lot of these issues. There was a Superior Court judge uh, here today who watched this movie, I saw her slip out the back um, a few minutes ago, but there was a Superior <laughs> Court judge here watching this. So we have, you know, we're, 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 this information is, is getting out there to the, to the right people. And all around the world, um, protections are being put in, not only in the law, but in um, the constitutions of some, of, uh, some countries uh, regarding protection of animals. Switzerland has in their constitution the welfare of animals as being a, 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 a national objective that is, that is equal to, so here you know, we, have, we, have, we think of F First Amendment, um, freedom of speech, religious protection, things that are enshrined in our constitution, equal, equal protection, which is what, what gay rights is about, um, tre treating um, the equal protection of the law, so that everybody's entitled to equal protection. In Switzerland, their constitution has animal welfare equal to those, to those issues, so it's a national objective. The legislature is bound to pass laws that, that protect animals. Um, in Egypt, when after the Arab Spring, when um, Mubarak was deposed, and then the Muslim Brotherhood came in, and they started doing some stuff that was bad, people didn't like them, so then the military took over, and they appointed a uh, a military drafting commission to draft a new constitution for Egypt, and there was a woman who worked tirelessly to get to get protection of animals um, in in that in that document. And so that the the um, the constitution of Egypt now has protection of animals, and it and it cites to um, to a passage in the Quran that that calls for the humane treatment of animals. And when the head of that drafting commission was asked to defend it, um, he drew on all of the the major religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, as all you know, referring to the humane treatment of animals, and this is something like, of course we're gonna have that in our constitution, why wouldn't we, you know? But at the time, it was very, it was very controversial, and, and this activist was able to get it in there through working tirelessly with this, this drafting commission. 
Um, so all of these things are, you know, it, it comes down to uh, people's uh, ability to get engaged and to, and to make, um, to change the law, both the, the framework that, you know, the Constitution is kind of the, the overall framework that the courts can enforce, and then, um, you know, lo local and, and state and federal laws uh, themselves that can be enforced by, by the authorities that are out there, as well as in California, um, private parties can, can bring lawsuits through the private attorney general doctrine, and there are many um, cases that, and I could go on and on about the cases that we're bringing in California to protect animals and, and activist rights, um, but I think it's almost nine, so we should probably open it up to quick Q&A, and, &A. and uh, I know Ellen's here too, and I can answer questions, so yeah. So my, it's a two-part question. One is, do, are there any animals slated in California for bringing a suit for, and then what would be the ultimate goal, like a class action suit? where everyone gets free? Well, okay, so California has this thing called the Unfair Business Practices Statute, and it allows suits to be brought against businesses that are violating any law, and it allows um, other entities to get an injunction against those businesses. It used to be until 2004 that anybody could bring such a suit. Now there, there are issues regarding standing, and you have to show economic harm, but we're looking at creative ways, and there have been a couple of very promising appellate court decisions that would allow us, so if, in, in other words, if, if a company like SeaWorld or you know any any business that's violating animal cruelty laws or any other laws that are out there, we could enforce those laws directly as private parties. And it doesn't require the animal to have standing as as an individual. It's just the legislature passes these laws, and if they're not being enforced by the proper authorities, then we come in as private parties to enforce them. And then, are we responsible for finding finding a new a, a new home for this? Because I love Corky, but she's not sleeping in my bathtub. Yeah, well, so SeaWorld would be uh, an interesting example because you, that if the orcas are going to be taken out of that captivity, then they have to be put in sea pens somewhere, and SeaWorld would have to be, you know, if they were subject to an injunction that said you can't keep the orcas in these, these tiny tanks, SeaWorld would have to pay for the, the you know, they're, they're orcas, and in that sense, the, the property status of animals is all, you know, could actually be used against them because the orcas belong to them, but yet they're not, they're not treating them in the proper way, so then they would have to pay for the... the tanks or the, uh, the, the sea pens uh, in order to do it. There is a project being built right now, the Whale Sanctuary Project by Dr. Naomi Rose and Lori Marino. They're doing a project for exactly what she's talking about, where would they would go after to retire Corky or Tillicum to these sea sanctuaries. So there are options besides SeaWorld, even if they don't want to fork out the money. So that's so people know about that. Right. Thank you. Sorry, I had to say something. No, that's good because yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure that groups would be willing to pay if, if, if SeaWorld would release them. So, yeah. Do you have a question, Jerry? Yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, animal personhood, uh, is there, uh, to the best of your knowledge or anybody else, a single judge in the United States, whether uh, state or federal, that could be characterized as? Uh, actually having the clue about the, uh, on the philosophical level uh, so that the judge could be sympathetic to the court, to the, to the cause. Okay, sure. Yeah, so the question was whether there's any judge at the state or federal level that's been identified as having some you know, philosophical sympathy um, to, that, that would uh, potentially lead to a good ruling. Um, and yeah, I'm sure that there are. And there, I mean, judges are just people just like anybody else. And so, um, I mean, the, the, the process by which judges uh, are, are appointed and become judges often, you know, it often involves a vetting process where um, that they end up being more more conservative than the rest of society. Um, but you know, they're still human beings that have empathy and can see that animals suffer and, and, uh, and intelligent animals like um, primates and orcas and, and uh, elephants would, would like to have their own autonomy uh, um, as well. So, uh, but you know, they're constrained by the law. So judges can't just they can't just you know create a new law. Um, the only court that can do that is the Supreme Court. You know what's the what's the rule? What's the what's the uh, what's the rule of the Supreme Court? It's that you need five. If you have five justices, you can do anything. So, they can, but you know, even they try to constrain you know what they're doing based on precedent and stare decisis, and, and uh, which is the concept that, that once it's been decided, that's that that remains the law, and that it's up to the political branches of government to change it. So, so really, you know, it's a process of kind of moving things along in a way that uh, you, know, you, you pass laws, you don't need necessarily a, a constitutional amendment to do what they're talking about in the movie. You could, you know, with, with, with science recognizing that um, these animals have the cognitive capacities that they do, you can envision a situation where 
uh, a, a primate or a cetacean could be granted uh, legal personhood, but then the question is, okay, so what's the, what is the outcome of that? I mean, really, it, you really ultimately are just talking about the, the welfare of the animal, unless you're talking, unless it's an animal that's just caught from the wild, and you're saying, go, you know, put the animal back, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have done that. Um, that, you know, that would be an interesting case there too, but when you're talking about a captive animal, and the question is how it's the treatment, it really does come down to a welfare question, which is what the courts kept going back to, and that's something that the, the political branches of government are there to address as well. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm sure that there are judges that are, that are more sympathetic than others, and that was one of the points of the, um, what, what Stephen Wise did in the movie was they were actually looking, for, they were trying to find that judge that was gonna be willing to make that first step, that first crack in the wall, and say, yes, we're granting a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of an animal, which would be you know, a watershed moment. Um, but you know, it's un unlikely that, that a judge is gonna be willing to make that step ahead of the, um, uh, the, the political branches and, and society. But you know, going back to uh, gay, gay rights, nobody could have thought that, that gay marriage would be the law of the land um, you know, just 10 years ago. And now all of a sudden it's just like, yeah, of course, why, you know, why wouldn't it be? So you know, it's, I mean, things can happen very quickly once people start to realize what's going on. So, uh, yeah, back there. So there's, in the, in the world of biomedical research, there is a lot of discussion around, um, you know, ethics with regard to humans. But so much of that was really sort of, you know, uh, it had its origins in, you know, the, the aftermath of World War II and the Nuremberg, you know, code and Declaration of Helsinki, blah, 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 report, all of that. But that was, I mean, we didn't have a good understanding of, you know, cognition, about animal cognition back then. Do you think that the clear delineation of, you know, humans versus non-human primates and all the stuff in preclinical research, you know, on animal models and stuff, do you know if there's been any sort of action at all there? Because the, the regulations and guidances uh, are, are so international that you would, you would think that certain things that may be done in certain ICH regions could have some applicability here. And sort of, I know this is a very complicated thing that is kind of tangential almost, but uh, the other thing is, I really haven't seen much discussion about what biomedical research could be without, you know, uh, you know, rodents and other, you know, non-human primates. It seems like with this, they at least have an idea of the the direction they want to go for these chimps. Has anybody really explored what options may exist beyond use of animals for developing a new drug? Oh yeah, in fact, I mean the NIH, everybody's moving away from. Uh, so-called animal models, for especially for toxicity testing and drug testing, because they, they stopped using uh, rats for, for a lot of this testing in favor of computer models um, recently because they determined that you know, it was no better than a coin toss as to whether these drugs are gonna be uh, safe and effective once they get into human clinical trials. Um, so yeah, you have it at, the, at that end with the animal testing um, end of things, we're seeing a, a move towards uh, better um, you know, non-animal uh, methods. And then on the cognition end, with the way that we're recognizing the way that uh, animals, uh, how intelligent animals are, and, and all the traits that they exhibit, we're seeing, um, you know, when when scientists used to define being a human as you know tool user and has cultural, you know, there are diff different um, definitions that they would use, and then all of a sudden with Jane Goodall's research, they realize. Wow, we have to either redefine uh, what a tool is, or we have to redefine what a human is, or we have to redefine because our definitions are matching up. And now we know that crows and uh, other birds use tools, and we're seeing, uh, and we know that you know ch chimpanzees and social animals have what can, can only be described as culture because there's cultural differences between the different groups. It's not genetically based, and it goes on through generations. So, I mean, there are, it's it's becoming, it's, you know, th these lines are becoming blurred, and and as that occurs, at, at one point it's going to become obvious that we should be, you know, treating, we should, we should be treating uh, animals with the same respect that we treat humans. And that's what, that's what al the book Animal Liberation is about. You know, it was written back in 1979, but it's written by a famous utilitarian ethicist, um, Peter Singer, who says, look, we're just, the fact that animals can, can differentiate between pain and suffering shows that they have interests that have to be respected. And so it's, it's not just a question of, it, you know, you can't just completely discount their interests, you should weigh it. To, an animal suffers the same way that a person suffers, so that should be part of the moral equation. Um, I think we're probably out of time. So. Can I just want to say one thing yeah. about bio? So here in San Diego, we have the UC school system that is still testing on animals. They are still testing on non-primate humans. At UCLA, they are still 
doing the same tests that they've been doing for 15 years over and over again. Here in San Diego, we have over 500 biotech companies and almost all of them are still testing on animals. There are some that are using computer models, but there's no money for these companies in using computer models. Um, animal research is big business. It's funded by our federal government with grants. These researchers are making millions of dollars and it's gonna take a lot of law to change the, these practices because the whole finance, financial balance is gonna switch when it comes to medicines, hospital, treatment of patients, and research. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done with um, research on animals. Unfortunately, San Diego is one of the leading cities of animal research in this country. And we need to change the laws there, quickly. It's still an FDA re requirement, a certain number of animal studies. I mean, even if there is increasing reliance on computer models, there's, there's still no way to get around that. Right. Well, they still are forced to test on some animals, like with Bo Botox. Even though it's been proven <laughs> that it's somewhat safe for human use before they can release certain batches, a certain amount has to be tested still on animals. And uh, another plug for the symposium that's coming up, Elizabeth Baker is an attorney who will be speaking at that, and her whole job with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is to work with the FDA. The FDA is way behind on the science. They're just doing things based on the way that they've always done it. And so it's, it's interesting that those that are driven by ethics and compassion are the ones that are actually on the cutting edge of science and are actually leading the way and showing that the FDA and the federal government that look, this is actually a more effective way to do things and, and, and beating them at, at their own game. And, and, that's what really, and that's what's happening in the law too, that it's the, it's the animal lawyers now who are at the cutting edge of constitutional law. You know, all of these fields in order to, you know, we're seeing it in, the, in food science as well. We're seeing, you know, beyond uh, eggs, we're seeing, you know, beyond meat, we're seeing these startups that are coming out and creating, uh, you know, market-based solutions to a lot of these issues as well. So we just have to be better than the, you know, than the, than the regulators and industry and beat them at their own game, and that's that's what, yeah. what's happening. So Thank you all for coming. And <laughs>